Welcome to Combos from the Couch from Life Stance Health, where each episode you'll hear engaging and informative conversations with leading mental health professionals that will help guide you on your journey to leading a healthier, more fulfilling life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Combos from the Couch by Life Stance Health. I'm Nikki Lianza, and on this episode, I'll be talking with Joy Hangman from our Englewood, Colorado office about attachment, attachment issues in foster youth in honor of May being National Foster Care Month. So welcome, Joy. Thank you for being on. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Let's start off. Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so I'm a licensed professional counselor in Colorado. I have worked in inpatient and partial hospitalization, residential, home-based and outpatient setting, outpatient settings. So I've worked a, kind of across the levels of care and specifically um, with foster care and adoption, I've gotten the chance to work at an adoption agency, a nonprofit for foster care, and then I have clinical experience working with foster and adoptive families. So it's really a passion of mine that I've gotten to lean into a little bit at Life Stance and in other settings as well. I, I can see that, which is, I, I'm so glad that you had this great experience and knowledge that you'll be able to share with us and our viewers and listeners to help us understand more about the attachment issues that can come up with foster youth. And I, I think a good starting question is to help us understand more about what are the, the various attachment styles that people can have? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great place to start. So I think even backing up a little bit from there, I'll give a brief overview of attachment. So what attachment is and kind of when we use that word, what we mean is it's the connection originally between a child and a caregiver or in adulthood, it's between someone and a primary relationship in their life. And so it's kind of the strength, quality and um, yeah, efficacy of the attachment or the, the relationship between those two people. And it's built through the cycle of rupture and repair. And so ruptures are inevitable. They're a part of every relationship. They happen even in the safest, healthiest relationships. And attachment's really less about the rupture, though it does matter. It's it's more about how the rupture is repaired, how the caregiver, the primary relationship comes back and repairs that injury or that rupture um, with the child or with the adult. So that's kind of how they're built. Um, I think a really helpful way to think about that is with babies, even though this applies to people of all ages, is a baby cries. They have some sort of rupture, or lack of safety in their environment. They're hungry. They are tired, whatever it is. They cry and then their caregiver responds and that builds an attachment. Their caregiver responds in all kinds of ways. So to answer your original question, then there's Four research shows kind of four main styles of attachment that most people um, will fall into. And, and those are even kind of in two categories. So the first category would be a, a secure attachment. And a secure attachment, the primary caregiver is a safe base for exploration. So that means that the child comes to them for comfort when they need it, but they also leave them to explore their environment. They feel comfortable in both settings, being connected and also being separate. And the next category of attachment styles we call insecure styles. And so these styles develop when there's some sort of more consistent rupture that hasn't been completely adequately repaired. And so one style of insecure attachment typically is called an avoidant attachment style. And this is where the child, based on the ruptures they've experienced, starts to expect rejection. And so they cope with that expectation by relying on themselves. So they're less likely to cling to the caregiver, to seek the caregiver for comfort. And they're more likely um, to try and solve problems independently. The other main insecure style is called ambivalent. And so this child has kind of the opposite strategy. They expect inconsistent caregiving from their primary attachment figure. And so they cope with clinging and enmeshment. They, they hold tight, scared that they're gonna lose it. So they both kind of go in different directions, solving the same problem. And then the last um, main attachment style is called disorganized. And this comes really from situations typically that involve abuse or significant neglect. So the child expects frightening or dangerous caregiving. 
And because of that, they're really not able to come up with an organized strategy to cope. So it's just, they kind of try lots of different strategies and then it's a bit more chaotic. So those are kind of the main four um, attachment styles. And, and thank you for sharing that. My understanding is, you know, whatever attachment style might, might, that might be developed in childhood, moving forward into adulthood, we might see people navigating issues within their relationships, romantic or otherwise, um, simply based on their attachment styles. So someone with more the avoidant might be avoidant of, of true intimacy or might reject before they're rejected, things like that. Is that what you're familiar with as well? Yes, yes, that's a great point. Um, and I also think it's important to bring up here that while we form our our attachment style in childhood, it's um, it's able to change. Okay. And so a lot of times if you kind of end up forming some sort of insecure style, which is a very common experience, um, research shows that less than half um, of people have secure attachments. So it's really common to have some sort of insecure style. Um, if you form that style, you can earn security later on in life with another okay. primary relationship. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of hopeful. Yeah, because I, I think people might, if they are researching attachment styles, which because I've seen a lot of this come up on social media and TikToks about, about this, they might think they're locked into, okay, that's just what I am and who I am and it, there's no hope to changing. And you're saying, yeah, that, that can change. And I think that's hope is very important for people to understand. Absolutely. Early, early research on attachment styles kind of painted them as more fixed. Um, but the more we've learned, the more that that turns out not to be the case, that they really can change if you have a safe, um, a safe relationship to work through some of that in. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm glad you shared that for sure. Very important for people to understand. Yeah. So bringing it to foster youth, why are foster youth at an increased risk for having attachment issues then? Yeah, great question. So it really comes back to that cycle of rupture and repair. So a foster youth, you know, has an inevitable rupture of being removed from their primary caregivers and then having to um, adjust to at least one set of new caregivers. And more often than not, foster youth um, move more often than once. So they end up having really inconsistent primary caregivers, primary attachment figures, um, which is very disruptive and creates and really challenges their sense of safety. Um, you know, we, when we think about the safe base, part of a secure attachment, um, part of a safe base is being reliable and knowing that you'll be there. And it's, yeah. um, for one, for lots of different reasons, it's hard for a foster youth to rely on their caregivers. There's a lot of inconsistency and so much of it is out of their control. So that puts them at a high risk. Um, and then also, circumstances that lead to a child being removed from their home often involve trauma. Trauma, you know, compromises safety, and that has a big impact on, on a child's ability to rely on a caregiver and to trust that they'll have their needs met. Because again, for all kinds of reasons, that didn't happen at some time. And I, I think bringing up that point of trust that for some individuals, especially, you know, being removed from their primary home, and having to enter a foster care, some trust issues really go back to infancy. And to give you an example, what I'm referring to here is if there is an infant in the crib, maybe even four or five, six months old, and the baby is crying repeatedly in the crib because they're hungry or their diaper is dirty or, or whatever. And you know, our main mode of communication as an infant is crying. And so if our if that biological family or that caregiver doesn't come to meet the needs you know, that child might already at that level start incorporating, I can't trust the world to help me take care of my needs, especially if it's repeatedly not happening. Yes. Yes. There's a really kind of famous landmark study um, or case study on exactly what you're talking about. There was research done in some international orphanages that were really understaffed. Yeah. And so in these circumstances, the babies stopped crying because it was became an ineffective way of yeah. getting their needs met. And um and that was a really um, shocking finding, but also very telling of what yeah. this works and what it does. Heartbreaking, you know, yes. to think a, a, an infant whose natural ability is to cry, to communicate, 
would be so reinforced by it not getting them reinforcement of someone to take care of them for them just to like, why didn't bother crying? I'm not going to get my needs met anyway. So that that is the telling sign, you know, yes. even as an infant, heartbreaking for sure. Right. And actually to your point too, some of this can even start during pregnancy. Um, you know, there's research showing that if mom is unsafe herself in the pregnancy and has increased stress, then there's more cortisol in her system and the baby is influenced by that. So they, they might come out um, with higher levels of stress hormones and with mm-hmm. lower levels of trust in their environment. So it's really a, a very dynamic relationship between um, in pregnancy, mom and the baby, and then after, you know, whoever the caregiver is and the baby. Right, right. Oh, I agree for sure. So what are some of the specific attachment issues foster youth may have? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of behaviors that show up that are communicating kind of this core need for for secure attachment. You know, we say behavior is the language of unmet needs, especially in children. So I've worked with a lot of families who um, like food hoarding or food related behaviors can be pretty prevalent in this population. For one reason or the not- another, the kid may have experienced food insecurity, and it's not easy for them to adjust to a food secure environment. Those are really deeply rooted fears. And so kids may binge, they may um, hide food in their room, they may struggle to regulate around food. Um, So that's a really common one we've seen. Also just self-advocacy. You know, I've worked with a lot of foster youth and um, youth with different attachment styles who really struggle to kind of ask for what they need. And like some concrete examples are, you know, I worked with someone who really ran out of shampoo and really needed shampoo and was, was nervous to ask because they had learned early on that your needs don't always get met when you ask. And um, that's something we really worked on. Okay. You got to ask your caregiver wants to provide for you, but they're not going to know unless you tell them. So Um, stuff like that. I think there's also a lot of testing and challenging behaviors. That's um, when you have an insecure attachment style, you have trouble trusting your caregiver. And so you're testing them to see how reliable they are. So that might mean like you brought up earlier, rejection, um, escalation can be sometimes creating some dangerous or threatening environments to see if the caregiver will stick around or if they are going to Um, kind of reinforce the child's narrative that they're going to leave or be unreliable. Um, Along that same line, you know, foster youth may be more sensitive to perceived rejection and abandonment. And um, one way that this is really important for caregivers, for foster parents, for bio parents to understand is that means that they need to be disciplined and corrected a little bit differently because they're so aware of abandonment and rejection. So there's this principle, um, I think originally from trust-based relational intervention, which is a modality of therapy specifically for kids from hard places. Um, And it's called the connect before you correct principle. So What it means is that before you give discipline or redirection or a boundary, you need to reaffirm the relationship. You need to sync up with the child, validate that you are sticking around, that you're connected to the child, that you're attuned, and then you can deliver the the boundary or the discipline. I I love that. I think that is so critical to secure the attachment and then go from there. That is, I, I think... I hope in lots of places that are training foster parents and, and as well as, as biological parents or caregivers of the, the youth to do that, you know, to definitely look at the connection first before the correction. Love that. And what was that called, that perspective called? It's um, trust-based relational intervention. So TBRI um, for short, and it came out of the work of Karen Purvis and she was based in TCU, Texas Christian University. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Any other yeah. takeaways you'd like us to know about the attachment issues for foster you? I would love to just shed a little light on a specific population of foster youth. So to give context here, you know, there's about 440,000 kids in foster care nationwide. And 25% of those kids are legally free for adoption. 75% are working towards reunification with their bio families. So it's a minority are legally free for adoption. Um, 
because reunification research shows is um, can produce the best outcomes for kids and families. Um, of those 25% that are legally free, they're not going to go back to their original families. They're looking for another permanent placement. There's about 26,000 youth who emancipate from foster care every year. So that means that they turn 18 without a permanent placement, yeah. Yeah. kind of while that process is still unresolved. And this population is at a really higher much more elevated risk for all kinds of things, for contact with law enforcement and homelessness, unplanned pregnancies, unemployment, PTSD, um, human trafficking, not graduating high school, poverty, incarceration, suicide, and ultimately losing their own children um, to foster care. And so I, yeah, just wanted to shed a light on this population because um, while they, carry a lot of risk, it's also um, an opportunity, I think, for clinicians, for families, for community mm -hmm. agencies to really make a difference. Intervening um, with this population is a way to leverage your influence and resources towards all kinds of issues. Um, and to really have an upstream or, or maybe a midstream um, <laughs> approach to helping some people and to um, kind of benefiting your community at large. I agree, which made me think of another severe attachment issues I was looking at as you were sharing about these youth aging out of the foster care system is a severe attachment disorder of reactive attachment disorder. Uh, do you feel comfortable sharing us just a little bit about what reactive attachment disorder is? Yeah, I think I could go at a at a high level about okay. reactive attachment disorder. Sometimes people call it RAD for short, um, RAD. And it, it's, in my understanding, it's very closely related to um, a disorganized attachment. It's a kid has had such significant ruptures, disruptions, trauma, and um, dangerous caregiving that they're... Uh, Un, unable to um, rely on a caregiver for safety, that they um, give a lot of rejection to their caregivers and are very dis emotionally dis and behaviorally dysregulated. And so it's, it's kind of a attachment style that then rises to what we call clinical significance, which gives it the diagnosis. The attachment styles we talked about earlier, those aren't diagnoses. They're kind of descriptive terms. Right. Reactive attachment style, that becomes a diagnosis um, requiring more clinical intervention. Got you. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us more about that specific disorder and, and helping those who maybe have never heard of it understand that that is a, a critical thing that uh, some foster youth might be struggling with and navigating through, for sure. So, yes. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Joy. You brought a lot of joy to our life as you <laughs> were you know, helping us understand more about foster youth and their attachment issues and just attachment issues, or just the importance of attachment in general. So I appreciate your knowledge and you sharing that knowledge with us. And I'd love to have you on the episode again in the future. Thank you so much for having me.